All right, it's time to talk with our featured guest, Dr. Priya Gens. Priya, how's it going? Going great. December, and uh, we're making it so far, which is great. That's awesome. And in December, you're in Dallas, you said, right? Is it super cold out there? I, re- I know like in the past, it's been frozen. It's bipolar weather. So some days it's 65. I think it was 85 last week, but then it was also like 33. Um, so the days will swing from super high to low and then everything in between. So at this moment, I think it's like 63. It's sunny. It's beautiful. But I think tomorrow there's an 80% chance of rain and it's going down to the 40s. That's so, crazy. Yeah. Last week it was 80s? Oh my gosh. What? <laughs> it's all over the place for you out there. Interesting. Does that affect like your, I don't know, what you plan to do, for example, like practice or is it like, nope, rain or shine, snow or whatever, we're open all the time? I mean, sometimes it does, especially if like we have patients who will travel from like East Texas or Oklahoma and for them, obviously the, the weather matters a little bit more. Um, so there's either delays or they decide maybe not the best idea. Um, when it's hot and sunny, everyone's just complaining that it's hot and sunny. And when it's cold and wet, everyone's complaining it's cold and wet. And so for the most part, we just deal with it, wear layers and, and hope for the best. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice. Awesome. So hey, if you can tell us a little bit about your past, your present, how'd you get to where you are today? Such a fun question. Um, okay. So I grew up in Canada, moved down to Texas halfway through high school, and then spent the next decade trying to leave Texas. So went to college in New Orleans, um, learned I wanted to become a dentist when I was in like eighth grade, did a career survey thing. Loved artistic things, working with my hands, loved the science and healthcare aspect of things and had a dentist across the street who I babysat for and he lived a, a great lifestyle. And I thought, oh, this looks pretty easy. I like this. So went to college in New Orleans, then um, went to dental school here in Dallas. And within, I think, a week of graduation, we had moved out to the D.C. area. I worked for Doc in a Box for about eight months. I think I made it eight months. And realized very quickly it was not my favorite place to be for a variety of reasons. Um, And we ended up moving out to the West Coast, to Washington State, Mm -hmm. where I um, got to work in what I thought was my dream practice. It was like the dental office, coffee shop, like we had espresso for patients. We had fresh baked chocolate chip cookies, all the the perks and benefits, um, super, super boutique. And it was owned by a clinical instructor at the Koi Center. And so I learned about John Coyce and kind of Coyce-centered dentistry a year out of dental school. And so my perspective has always been post-grad has been looking at it from the perspective that John Coyce teaches at the Coyce Center. So I was there, I was in Washington for almost seven years. I worked for the first practice for about like six months and then the economy tanked. That was uh, 2008, Mm -hmm. going like a bunch of employees, like everything went sideways all the promises of what you can do as a dentist were kind of just shattered and broken. And um, he found me a home at a practice that had four other dentists open six days a week, 12 hour days. And we all rotated through and the owner was a mentor at the Poise Center as well. So it was a very Mm -hmm. different form of Poise Dentistry. And it was a much busier practice. The location was huge in terms of how everything worked. Um, So I worked like three days a week there. And really got a sense of the good, bad, and ugly of of how dentistry works. After that, I had a wee one and realized that 12-hour days were just not great when you have a newborn. And I ended up doing a, like working for a startup that was built by a denturist in Washington State. Denturists are, they can practice independently. They make dentures and have a dental practice. So I worked Mm -hmm. with them for almost six months and it was somewhat disastrous um, for a lot of reasons, um, but learned a lot. Mm-hmm. And then moved into a practice that was more of like a very, very small DSO in Washington State that was privately owned, but he had like five practices along the Puget Sound and um, did that. So I moved back to Texas when we wanted sunshine, margaritas, and grandparents to help with the two year old. Worked for a DSO here for a couple of years, realized this was just not, it wasn't, a, it was a good way to like get my lay of the land, learn more about what dentistry is like in Dallas now and what I liked, didn't like, location, all of that. And then um, went into what was going to be a partnership with another colleague, but realized about a year and a half, two years in that I'd not bought into her practice, mm-hmm. but we had 
talked about doing it. And I realized like our values just didn't quite align. The way I wanted to practice was not the same as how she was running her practice and never was that going to actually work. Ultimately ended up buying a um, an existing practice that lived in a Victorian house. That's where I'm sitting right now. And ah. it was kind of the scaffolding of she had owned the practice for 20, 25 years and really just needed someone to say, hey, you need to retire. Let me buy your practice and and take over. So it ended up being kind of the scaffolding or building blocks for what I have now. So it's kind of like a glorified startup where I had I had patience. So I had some cash flow, but I had to, you know, I changed out the flooring, took off the wallpaper, changed out the water lines, went from analog film processing to digital, all the things. And then we had to educate the patients in the the value of gums not be, being inflamed and bloody and mm. Um, look what we can see in these lovely big digital x-rays. And through this journey, I've always seen things from a risk-based perspective where we're really looking at not just the teeth, but the whole person. What is the individual risk for each patient in terms of your periodontal risk, foundation, structural risk with caries and restorations, functional risk in airway, and um, you know, aesthetically, what risks do we have in place? For me, I can't do that in two minutes or seven minutes. Like it's a it's a conversation. Um, and so through this practice journey, everyone had always told me like, you need to speed up. You need to talk less. You need to do more of the dentistry and more of the like selling, if you will. Mm-hmm. And it was always just like, I know, but like, how how can I treat a stranger? How can I really get to the root of what's wrong with them if I don't take the time? And so it was something that, I mean, it's just been a recurrent theme to the point that when I left the practice um, that I was going to buy into, I took like a six month sabbatical and really got into podcasts and all the different things, learning like, what what do I need to be a business owner? Am I ready for this? What do I want to do? What does this look like? And really kind of getting into like, what would that be in real life as I worked on negotiating to buy this practice. Mm-hmm. And so a friend of mine was like, oh, hey, by the way, I contacted the uh, the dental director over at the, the DSO that I'd worked for for a couple of years just to see if maybe you could work there part-time or something. And I was like, no, you didn't. He's like, it's okay. He said, you're not a good fit for a DSO. And I was like, he's right. He's so right. I am not a DSO dog. Like I can't, I dance to my own tune. You can't tell me I have to sell a product I don't believe in. You can't tell me I have to like meet these metrics unless I believe in it, I want to do it. I want to do it for me. That was a big piece of kind of where me owning my own practice really came into play where I was like, I'm so broken. Like no one does coist dentistry down here. Nobody does any of that stuff. Like I need to do it myself and I need to create what it is that I want to practice in. And so that's really where we have landed. Um, Circa about 2019, 2020, I realized when I'm looking holistically at patients, and that's like holistically with a W. Well, I also do care about what kind of materials, what kind of, you know, what toxins are residing in our oral environments. And especially as dentists, like what are we taking in as well? So like with my daughter, when she was born, we cloth diapered, you know, they're on organic, all the things like super mm-hmm. much crunchier than I realized I was. I am one of those like kid has a fever. I'm not calling the doctor. Like, let's figure out what's going on and, you know, give it some time and see what we can do to heal before we mm-hmm. medicate. And so that's my personal philosophy. And I realized like a lot of the patients I was attracting were those kind of patients too, where they didn't trust a lot of the conventional things. They didn't necessarily, you know, they wanted to understand more than just like, oh, I didn't brush and floss my teeth and now I have these problems. Like what else is going on? Mm -hmm. And do about it that's not fluoride? What can I do about it that's, you know, I'm doing everything that I should be doing otherwise. Why does this look like this? Why am I breaking down? Um, And so really starting to cater to those patients and um, learn more about like what, what kind of dentistry does that was really where my practice, I think, took a turn and um, has allowed us to kind of get to where we are now, which is a biological or holistic dental practice, both with a W and just a straight up H. So crunchier, where we're looking at the whole person, we're looking at how do we detox, how do we reduce the toxic load for these patients, especially the ones who, I mean, they're just, they're sick. They've Mm -hmm. got Lyme, they've got, they're just more sensitive. They have other issues and everybody looks at them like they're crazy and dismisses them because they ask questions and they need somebody who can kind of be on their team and even just listen. You know, a lot of what we do is 
the same as any other dentist does, right? We're going to drill, we're going to fill, we're going to do local anesthetic. But for some people, you know, the material matters a lot. Mm -hmm. For some people, they need to work a tooth at a time and then they need to be on a detox protocol and they need to work with another provider who can help them to reduce the inflammation and just the response to any kind of trauma to their bodies. And so it's been really interesting and eye-opening and I probably learn more from my patients than they teach me at this point in time because I'm like, oh, I don't know anything about that. Maybe I should find out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think interesting. That's, oh, and I guess the other piece of that is I did finish my voice center journey. Uh -huh. <laughs> finished, but I did graduate like 10 years after I started at the center. And so that also factors big into the practice um, in terms of how, I mean, it's a really good curriculum for merging, looking big picture, looking at the patient. And then also from a research evidence-based perspective, factoring in the other parts and pieces of material safety, material science, biotoxicity, all of that stuff too. Yeah. No, interesting. Okay. So real quick, Tons yeah. of questions. But before we get into those questions, uh, how long have you, this acquisition started when and how long have you had it? So I bought the practice in June of 2018. So we're at five and a half years. Okay, five and a half years. Like okay. it's not five and a half years because COVID was in the middle of that, but you know. This is out, yeah. Just a bump in the road. No big deal. Uh, it's interesting. We rewind back. The yeah. lifestyle of the doctor you were, you said you were babysitting or you were, yeah, yeah that's what attracted you. Are you... Do, would you say, yeah, I'm living that lifestyle now? <laughs> no. <laughs> Your face. You're like, oh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Sure. no. Um, I mean, it was a piece of it for sure. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It attracted me to it. But no, I mean, he, A, the lifestyle of a male dentist versus a female dentist is so different. I feel mm. like we need, we all need wives. I need a wife. Like my husband's super supportive. Thank goodness. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here right this moment doing this thing. Yeah. Uh, but like, I think part of it too is like, that was back in what, the 80s, 90s? How old am I? Oh, I'm going to say the 90s just, just for fun right now. Yeah, yeah. Early 90s, different lifestyle, right? Like the dentist lifestyle of that era was, you didn't have to work to market. People showed up. So you go to work, you do the dentistry and you leave and like everybody caters to you at the office, right? Like for me, I feel like that's just not the case. Especially Why? What, what, what is it different? And also, if you can kind of like elaborate a little bit more on like male and female dentists. There's so many things. Um, so I guess, what does it look like now? For me, I, and it might just be because of who I am and how I practice and we're a very tiny lean practice, but I go to work, I do the dentistry, but then when I leave work, there's more work to be done, right? There's yeah. always, at least for me, like, so whether it's chart notes and stuff or it's some sort of marketing efforts. Like, how does this look different? I think also like we started with kids later, which if you want to go into the female male dynamic, like I didn't have children until I was 30, largely because I wanted to get through dental school and then be married for a while and then feel like we had a lifestyle established enough that we were ready to have kids. So we really did. We kind of pushed things out a good while before having children. But because of that, like the kids have been young for, for so much of my practice now, even that, you know, trying to balance those things. And as mom, early childhood living, childcare, making sure they have all of their things requires a lot of me outside the office. But then also I'm required so much within the office. And as a female doctor, I feel like my female team, and I have a fantastic team now, so let me put that out there. But I feel like the team members don't necessarily coddle me as much as they would if I were a male doctor. They kind of, you know, they're like, well, you can do that yourself versus like, oh, here, doctor, let me go get this for you. There's just a little bit of a different mindset um, and attitude, or maybe I just give off the like, I can do this myself. Leave me alone. I don't know. But I, I feel like I hear that amongst other women dentists as well. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I get you. I get, do you feel like, would you ever ask for it? Would you ever ask for like, guys, can you help me? Like kind of thing or... Yeah, I mean, I would, but I think it's even just stuff like, hey, doc, you haven't eaten lunch. Do you want me to order something for you? Even in a practice where I, my co-doctor was, was a male doctor, they just were asked or provided with more support than I and my female counterpart was. So I mm -hmm. guess there's the contrast for you. And I don't feel like I necessarily need it. But, but it it's was, nice. It's it, nice it, to like to know that people are thinking of you like, oh, yeah. they haven't eaten lunch. You know what I mean? Like, 
Yeah. It's not that, that I can't have that more now with my team, but certainly there's been significant periods of time where it's like, oh, I better eat something. Or I don't know. I think it it's just a different dynamic. No, yeah, that's interesting, especially from the 90s, but also like the male and female. I never thought about that. Yeah. You gave yeah. me something to think about. Yeah, that's really interesting. And then if we fast forward, you mentioned Doc in a Box. What is that? It's a DSO. It was, you know, one of the larger internet or national corporations. Um, very, I won't mention any names unless you want me to, but it was the very, you know, system from the the practice management system with like the, it wasn't like DOS, but basically like you had to type everything um, in. Yeah, 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 yeah. In your charts, um, not up to date anything. And I remember my first day there, I saw 30 patients. Wow. Which, well, did it, how did, what did you learn from that? A lot. It was painful. Um, I mean, and it was paper charts. So I learned real quick how to template my notes in paper because um, that was a big deal. Mm-hmm. It was interesting because the two doctors that had been there previously both left at the same time. And the only people left were like the support team. So the hygienist and the the assistants. And one of the doctors had, I mean, this man was he produced a ton. He was a top producer, but he was doing root canals unlike anything he could access, basically. So there'd be like 16-year-old girl, perfect dentition, had a big old endo number 19 and a PFM. And and you're looking at her going, what happened here? Saw a lot of that, which was really interesting and challenging. And it was an office where there'd been a lot of turnover. So one of the first things I think that I really had to learn was like, how do you finesse and create a relationship and trust quickly in an environment where there's been a ton of turnover and a ton of transition and, you know, trying to communicate to patients their needs, trying to establish that like, you're not just another doctor who's going to be in and out, which unfortunately I was, but, you know, in the meantime, I'm here, I'm here for you was a really interesting challenge, especially when you're what 25 and look like you're not 25, like patients, they don't view you as the doctor. And so it was a really interesting learning experience, especially where like you literally have like two minutes to get through this person and be done with your exam and move on. Do you Priya recommend like, because I've heard this before, where they're like, hey, you're just getting out of residency, like, and you're looking for an associate, go to a DSO, get some grit under you. And then, or do you recommend like, no, don't do that. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I think it kind of depends on, on the individual company and the person. So there's, I've, feel like I've practiced in all different practice environments at this point over the past 15 years. And there's something to be gained from each and every one of those experiences. Would I repeat them? Probably not. Mm-hmm. But, you know, from a DSO setting, what you do get is, I mean, they teach you a lot about how to present treatment. They teach you a lot about like standardizing some of the things you do. You don't have to worry about, you know, paying your assistance. You don't have to worry about, um, If someone doesn't show up, like chances are someone from an office down the way might be able to pop in and and be there for you. So I think that is, there's some value to that for sure. There's value to just having other people around you who've done it. Although some DSOs, you are the sole doctor. So then you're really relying upon maybe a dental director or someone to mentor you. But I think ultimately, like in today's world, I think it's hard to find a private practice Mm -hmm. that take you on and, and trust you know, their patients and your care if you, you're you just right out of school. And so that's a really tough, actually like your first five years of practice, right? It's like, ooh, a little rough. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> like that's true. Skill-wise or just the judgment. I feel like you don't really get that judgment until you're at like year five. For me, maybe I was a late bloomer, but like year five when I was like, yeah, I really, I'm good. Like I, I have my mentors, I have people I can rely upon, but like, I feel like I got this. It was like, cool. Yeah, I'm I'm good. And year 15, I was like, I have a lot more to learn. <laughs> oh, no, now I'm going back. I have a lot more to learn. No, that's yeah. good. That's good that yeah. you have that mentality, though. Then fast forward, you worked in your dream practice. Yeah. And so if the economy, if they kept you on, do you think you should be working there today? Or would you be like, yeah, eventually I would have? Would have outgrown it, I think. Um, largely because of where it was, too. Um, mm. Where Washington State, it was. We were trying to move to either Seattle or Portland, and we ended up in Puyallup, which is described as a bedroom community outside of Tacoma, or outside of Seattle. And it's like the exurbs. And it was very cool for almost seven years, but I, I would, the creature comforts of Dallas were better for me, or like 
maybe somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. But um, right. outside of location, like it was a neat practice. It was neat to see, I guess, especially going from the the very corporate minded <laughs> to this entirely different experience. Um, and I think ultimately I still would have wanted to do my own thing and spread my own wings and design the practice the way I wanted it to be. But um, I mean, it really gave me a real quick insight into like, how would I like to practice? And guess what? I don't have to see 30 patients in a day. I can see five. I can see three and it would be okay. And we can still be profitable and productive and make a difference and do what I want to do. And Mm -hmm. I think that was a big. Yeah. Is there anything you took from that practice that you're currently utilizing, like any systems or anything like that, that you're doing today in your practice? Um, I think we've modernized them a little bit, but, um, so we, instead of serving um, lattes and, and chocolate cookies, we do serve hot tea. I actually partnered with a tea maker in New Mexico to have like our own custom blend of mm-hmm. tea. So it is a signature tea that patients actually do come in to like have a cup or take a bag home and enjoy. So that's kind of a bit similar. It's not coffee shop, but it's tea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think really just that concierge level of care, really knowing each of our patients pretty darn well is also a big piece of what I took from that practice. Um, and then his, he was one of the first. So the owner of that practice, he was in like the inner circle um, right at the very beginning with John Boyce when he did classes out of his office in Fife, Washington. So he's one of like the the OG Boyce guys. Everything I learned from him, I mean, I learned photography from him. I learned kind of just intake new patient protocols and, and that experience and so I've taken that and I feel like I've elevated it some and modernized it some and added more to it. But that all started way back when in that office, just in terms of really diving into the questions and really trying to get to know my patients and understand their motivations for being here and for seeking care to begin with. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. And then fast forward, you worked for another practice ride and a lot more dentistry. And then you moved back to, or you moved to Dallas because of it's interesting. What made you move back was a change of lifestyle too. Like you're like, hey, my family lives there, right? And then you're I, like, I wanted, I want them to be around our, our child, right? So when yeah. you did that, you worked for a DSO again. What? Talk to me about that. How was how was that? Knowing that you're like, oh, I just got a good, good, a lot of highs. You know what I mean? Like, and then we got to go back to. I was. It was interesting. So, um, you know, I was initially very even interviewing with them, I was like, oh, it's a DS though. Like, this is <laughs> not going to go well. I don't want to do this. But I was like, okay, it was, it was presented to me as like the best of the worst. Um, mm-hmm. Nothing best against the worst. Best That's se, but for me, who was just not that person at this time or whatever, um, it was, I was like, okay. So it was a different experience from the get-go. I like went to dinner with the dental director and uh, the office manager of the practice I was interviewing to join somebody else as well. And so number one, like having a dinner meeting as opposed to like a go into a clinical sterile environment was a, a neat way to introduce and learn about the practice and the people who are in the leadership part of it. Um, this particular DSO at that time he didn't hire anybody who had less than five years of experience. Um, the tenure of most of their doctors in most of the offices, with the exception of like the, the redheaded stepchild out east of here, um, doctors stuck around for at least two plus years. My co-doctor had been there for 10, 12 years already. The person I was replacing had been there for five and she was pregnant and didn't want to practice anymore. So I knew that there had been some longevity in the practice. The demographics of the office, the modern technology that was present there. Those were all really good things. And I really clicked with the office manager right off the bat. So (laughs) those were some key factors that I thought were important. Um, They seemed to have a good commitment to training and um, kind of allowing us to really do our own treatment plans and manage our own patient pool, which was great. So it was a neat experience that way. Things kind of changed after about a year and a half. The, uh, the dental director got sick and there's some changes in the management and they started wanting to uh, bring on HMOs, extend hours, do weekends. And those were all things that were kind of non-negotiables for me. I had worked Saturdays for three and a half years. And uh, after my last Saturday, I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing that anymore. No more. Um, and uh, 
I also won't do HMO dentistry because I just, I, I can't. Mm-hmm. I value my patients and, and me too much to, to do that. So that was a big non-negotiable for me. And then evenings, I mean, you just don't want me working on your teeth at 6, 7 p.m. Like, I'm not a yeah, you, don't, you don't want me to work on it. That's yeah. a good way to put it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. So all these things cause you to eventually to say, hey, I'm leaving. I'm going to go do a partnership, you said? Was it a partnership that you wanted to? Yeah. Why didn't that work out specifically? It was a few different reasons. I always knew I wanted to do dentistry the coist way. I just, that's how I think. That's how I've learned. It's a very different way of practicing than what we learn when we get out of dental school. Mm-hmm. A big piece of that is just being really committed to really high quality continuing education, right? Like we're not done learning ever. The person that I was potentially working with was burnt out. Um, she was like, I feel like I've learned everything I need to learn. Like I'll keep up with magazines and stuff, but like, I'm good. I don't want to drop five, $10,000 to, to go to a class. Like, I don't, it's not what I want to do. And that's just not in alignment with one of my core values of really always trying to grow and educate and learn and provide the best for my patients and myself that way. Um, so that was a really, really big piece for me, at least in terms of like, When I realized we, that was never going to change for her, that we can't be in business together if we don't share that same, I guess, commitment to education. Mm -hmm. The other, our management styles were also very different, which can work, I think, if they're synergistic. But I often felt like I got the blame for creating this like environment of chaos in the practice and that I just wasn't doing things. But I also really, I wasn't an owner in the practice. So like when you're an associate who might buy in, while you have a lot of responsibility, you also can't do a lot of things because you're not the owner. You don't write the paychecks. Like whether the employees are not going to listen to you or if you do something, you're going to get in trouble potentially because it's not what the owner would have done. Like it's a tough dynamic. I think I knowing now being in the seat of the owner, the decisions you make ultimately are, are yours. And mm-hmm. like, I can't share those decisions with anybody else unless I know that we have like an equal stake in the practice and that we both moving toward the same vision and goal. So like even my husband, like he has, he'll periodically make suggestions and I'm like, yeah, cool. That's nice, honey. Like <laughs> go back to your hidey hole. Like I don't, you're not the boss. This is not Who your boss. Who asked you? And yeah, like, pretty much. So he's like, okay, me. Yep. Yeah. It's your thing. I think it's kind of the same thing. Like when you have, it's hard. I mean, to do a buy-in to partner, um, a friend of mine described it as a, you know, a loveless marriage with no sex. Like you're in this together. It's a business relationship. You should like each other and match together and share similar like mission, vision, values. But at the end of the day, like it's the business relationship. You can't like kiss and make amends. It's just, it's hard to find that person, I think, or people that you can really do that with, especially if you're very strong in in what you think needs to happen mm-hmm. you like alpha females who think my way is a good way to do it like that can be tricky mm-hmm. but really it just was compatibility wise it wasn't it wasn't going to work and this is not anything to speak negatively of that other person but like I always felt less than I felt like I just wasn't as good at doing the things even though I wasn't that wasn't really my role mm-hmm. it was hard because there were things I was expected to do sometimes, but not always. And so not really knowing what this expected of me as that associate to buy in was tough. Because when you don't know what, what you're supposed to be doing, it's hard to do what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's true. Yeah. You need, that's why you need like the guidelines, set systems, right? Rules to know like, okay, the more of you, the more principles you have, I guess the more you can be guided of like, okay, this is what we're going to be doing kind of thing. But if you're just like, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like partnerships sound like a good idea, but you know what I mean? Because you don't want to make a sole decision on your own. You kind of want to go out and this risk together. I don't know. I don't know. know, I'd like to think that there's somebody out there that would work well with, you know, most people. But it's, I mean, again, like, like a marriage, like how hard is it to find that partner in life? And there's a lot of other things that certainly fall into that. But like, if it's hard to do that, then to find a partner as a business partner too can be really challenging. I think it might be easier to find a partnership where like the delegation of responsibilities is significantly different. I mean, the partnerships I see that work are typically like, well, they make all the like the clinical and HR decisions and they do more of the like, you know, the admins. So you've got really that operational versus the 
Like, the, yeah, like operations, CFO, CEO, right? COO kind of thing. Yeah, no, I get you. I get you. Interesting. So yeah. then we fast forward and now you have your practice acquisition for five years. How did you find your location? Okay. So um, when I was in dental school, I had a big brother in dental school and he has taken that role on as like his lifetime role for me. So when I told him I was moving back to Dallas, he was like, cool, let me set you up with this interview. So that is how I ended up at the DSM. Mm -hmm. And then um, when the partnership thing didn't work out, he's like, cool, guess what? We're going to uh, lunch with this lady. And actually, even when I was first moving to Dallas, I was like, I have this practice in mind for you. And I was like, dude, I don't even know where the Metroplex were living. Like, I don't know anything. I'm not buying anything. Let's table that. So fast forward, I guess like four years. Yeah, about four years. That same name popped up again. He's like, okay, she needs to retire. You need to buy her practice. We are going to lunch on Thursday. You need to be here at this time. So I went to lunch with him and um, this woman I bought the practice from. And we talked about her practice and dentistry and all the things. And then um, I think later that week, I came by to, to walk through, walk around. So she was not selling the practice. She was practicing but she was taking at least two months off a year to travel and do things. She had one employee and then a couple of temp hygienists who'd come in periodically to, to do hygiene. And that was it. And nice. so, um, but she owned the building and the practice. So I was buying real assets. Okay, that's good. That's really, really good. So then from that moment on, what did you kind of change when you decided to take over the acquisition? Did you Does that one employee still working there or...? She lasted about a month. And it was just Why? Why did she last only a month? I think she realized, so my initial plan wasn't to change a lot. I mm -hmm. did hygienist that I worked with at the DSO practice who followed me to the private practice who then followed me to this practice. So we worked together for about eight years, which was great. So she was my person. And so she came into the practice with me as a hygienist and assistant. So we came in and we started cleaning things out. And um, not only had this, the doctor I bought the practice from owned the practice for like 20 years, she had uh, like merged two prior practices. One doctor had had a stroke and another had had a heart attack, like mm -hmm. other stuff. And so we had this like sort of pack, you know, dentist or pack rats, right? We're going to keep this thing just in case. So every cabinet had like all the stuff just full crammed in there. So we mm -hmm. had to start cleaning stuff out. We started, you know, working on equipment maintenance and stuff and like ripped the carpets out, ripped the wallpaper off the walls, repainted, all of that. We start looking at water lines and there's like, you know, you open the, the trap and you're supposed to have like the, the clean traps in there. Well, there's like a blue pill and like a thing of like a two by two and cotton roll shoved in there. And that was it. And so we mm -hmm. were starting to ask questions like, what, what is this scenario here? Because then you take it out and it, it was like a layer of a black Bread just inside the trap. Like we had to extricate that trap and like we start looking a little deeper. And so there's just, we, we ended up changing out every single water line because there's just stuff in the water line. And so that was one example of some things that just hadn't been well maintained. While we were not imparting judgment, oh, sterilization bags were being taped closed. And then when it got run through the autoclave, then they would open the bag, take the stuff out and then reuse the bag. And it was a chemoclave. It wasn't even an autoclave. Uh -huh. So like that, where we're like, so I know this is how we were doing it before, but this is how we're going to do it now kind of stuff. And I think mm -hmm. she kind of plays like, ooh, this is, this is a lot of stuff. And I think it was a lot to take that on. She'd been with the other doctor for 20 years. And so she found her way out. And yeah, so she was there for okay. a month. Okay. Huh? It was helpful, actually. One really interesting thing we did was we printed out all the patients who were of record in the practice. And I had her go through because she'd been there for 20 years. Like, can you just like write me a note about each of these patients that you know, so that like, I have a sense of who they are, if there's any like red flags or anything like that. So, you know, there could be one that was like, only comes in when something's falling out of their head yeah. or make sure you collect first on this patient. Otherwise you're not going to see the money. So stuff like that, which was very helpful um, as we did transition and I had a new team and we could not, you know, these patients are worthy salt of the earth. Like we've been coming here for years. Like we don't want to trust this new human being, let alone a new team who has changed the entire practice, right? So she was there a month. Patients asked about her for about a year. And, mm. now, well, and then like everything was fine after that. 
Did you lose a lot of the patient database or you did? Oh, wow. It wasn't, a, I mean, we had like 300 patients to start with. Oh, okay. So I really bought the building and. How, yeah. how did you feel about that pre op where you're like, you're losing patients, you're losing patients. Does anything ever come to your mind? Like, the heck, like, what are we doing wrong or anything like that or no? You know, the first couple, kind of, but then what was interesting is every time we lost a patient, the phone would ring. Like we'd mm-hmm. end up losing a patient. So it was like this really interesting dynamic of like, out goes one, in comes another. And like, hey, okay. And, you know, they weren't my patients and yeah. they didn't see me. And they, a lot of them we lost because we share, you know, we showed them like, hey, you've been getting like healthy gum cleanings for years, but your gums are bleeding. You have bone loss. There's stuff beneath the gums that needs to be removed. Like there's disease going on here and we need to treat that. And they didn't want that. And so if my job and my goal, and I'm here because I want you to be better and feel better and have improved health systemically too, and you don't want what I have to offer, then this is not a good fit. And you need, you do need to find care elsewhere. But we sent out letters from myself and from the outgoing doctor, every single patient that was like a goodbye and a hello, we physically mailed out. But we'd have patients call and they'd be like, so the new doctor, is she from like Pakistan or India or like, where's she from? But in a way, like they were, I mean, they kind of racially profiles me. And really? then they come in and see me and they're like, does she speak English? Like, yeah, yeah. My friend Death's person didn't tell me about it for like six months. And I was like, I don't remember how it came up in conversation. I was like, seriously, these patients were like questioning my race, like here in Dallas in 2018. Like, really? Yeah. But yeah, it was it was interesting. What city in Dallas are you located? In Dallas. Like Dallas? Proper. Oh, okay. Here you gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Interesting yeah. that, that that occurred though. You know what I mean? I mean, there's people like that though. You know what I mean? And that's, yeah, that's gonna happen. And kind of like an older older population. And I guess they just Yeah. People, you know, if they want to find a reason not to like you, though. Yeah. I think they say, like, you can be the ripest, juiciest peach ever, but you're always going to find that one person who's like, I don't like a peach, right? And then yeah. that's what happens. So, but interesting. Yeah. So then throughout this process, what's been some of the best companies you worked with and some of the worst or ones that just didn't fit with you? So the first website I had made, I don't know, I was dumb, I guess. Like, they, they touted it as like, they were going to make this video for me and they'd make a website of like $6,000 or something. It's like, okay, that's not bad. But it was this company that did not just dental, they did all kinds of stuff, but it was like the most like canned website, which thankfully they were willing to change for me. Like we, I just had to give them all the content, all of mm-hmm. the different parts and pieces. And it took like six months to get the website live because they just couldn't quite get it to where I wanted it to be. And then they didn't tell me that there was like an annual fee on it. And they waived it. No, they didn't waive it. It was not a fee until like two years in, which was like the end of the contract. And if I didn't pay that fee, they would wipe the website. And they didn't really warn me. And then I had questions and they ended up just pulling the entire site. And so I had no website. All of a sudden, I was like, what? Yeah. Uh, what do I do? So thankfully, I actually had a friend who um, does marketing and she she made me a site. So that was, I'd say that was one of the, the more negative experiences. The worst site, yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, we all have our website and those media things, I think, that are not always the best experiences. It's hard, mm-hmm. to, hard to know who to trust. Um, love my practice management software, which is Oryx, O-R-Y-X. Um, mm-hmm. I spell it. When I first started, everyone's like, Excuse me. What is that? That's not Dentrix. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's none of those. But I was an earlier adopter of Oryx. So we transitioned in 2018 after I bought the practice. We had Easy Dental, which is like a spinoff of, I think it might be a baby Dentrix even, maybe. But cloud-based, based on the principles that John Coyce teaches, which was amazing because nothing out there is like that. Nothing is able to give you like this risk-based profile broken into the four food groups. Like that is how my brain works and sees patients. And it was able to be created into this software that does the same thing. And Mm -hmm. it's easy to present to patients and communicate with patients when they see things in three colors, which seems like such a simple thing. But in terms of just building credibility and trust right off the bat, having this system that has number one, it has like so many different things built into it. It's not just 
charting and, and treatment planning, but also like your communication with patients so you can text and email them. And there's a review component and there's the easy auto confirmations, all that's built into one system. Even how you enter the data, you're entering diagnostics first. What is the diagnosis? And then you're creating a treatment plan based on that diagnosis. You get to enter in like, how big is that composite on number 19? Is it less than a third of the isthmus width? Is it a third? Is it greater than half? And it shows on the like odontogram, look at that big ass filling of the thing. <laughs> yeah. Or like, oh, that's pretty little. And so when patients see that, or even like your team sees that, if they're not super dental savvy, like they're able to grasp real quick, like that's real big. What do we think is going to happen? And the system automatically then creates a risk profile based on what you enter in. And so it's very straightforward then to share with patients or even to like agree with yourself, right? Because some days you'll look at something and think one thing and the next day that sway kind of kicks in and you're like, hey, we can probably watch. No, look, mm-hmm. here's the criteria. We know the data supports this. Therefore, this is what we should be doing is a lot easier to ration with yourself even, I feel like, than just the, the standard software that's out there where you're like, well, I see a filling is on that too. That's all yeah. I know about. Interesting. Were you shopping around before that or did you immediately get it because of the Koi Center? I got it because of the Koi Center. I wanted that. And I had multiple people tell me like, don't be an early adopter. Like that's kind of daring. My IT company who set everything up was like, we don't know anything about this. I'm like, that's okay. Just talk to them. They'll talk to you. We'll figure it out. And they ended up, they're like, oh my God, the back end on this system is amazing. Like this mm-hmm. is phenomenal. I was like, yay, go me. Yeah, you, you go me. <laughs> like, yeah. don't necessarily know. I just knew I had a lot of frustrations with Dentrix and EagleSoft. Those were the two that I used primarily mm-hmm. uh, through my years prior to this. And they're good systems, but like they didn't really leverage the power behind that risk-based treatment planning. And even like the medical dental history to be able to have that in a system that just creates risk and allows people to actually look at it and own it and understand the questions you're asking. So like when we have a new patient, they automatically get a link to submit all of their medical dental history forms. The history every single question has a reason behind it. So if I'm asking you about your level of dental fear, if the patient has a high level of fear, the little risk thing goes up and there's a little thing on the side that says, hey, make sure you're asking patient about why they have fear. Like there's this little little guy on your shoulder who's telling you like, hey, this is, might yeah. be important because of this. Or if they have diabetes, like A1C, this is what you're looking at. If it's above this or below this, you should be concerned because or consider cross reactions with whatever. And so um, when the patients see it, there's pictures that go with, especially some of the dental things, like, is there notching on your teeth? And there's like a little diagram, a little video that'll show like where the notching might be. So the patients can be like, huh, my gosh, yeah, there is. And so Mm -hmm. awareness and ownership to some of the things that they have going on, then they can come in. A lot of times they're like, oh my gosh, you asked about this? And I never thought about that, but oh my goodness, like, yeah, I snore when I sleep. Should I be concerned about that? And so just that level of education that patients are coming in with has been a really big game changer for us. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. That makes us happy. So then from that, throughout this whole process, Priya, we're coming to a close here, but let's talk about from the moment you decided in your mind, like, I want to, I want to own a practice. I want to own my own. So today, what's been some of the biggest struggles, fails, or pitfalls you've encountered? Great question. I think like most people, I think finding your people, finding your team has been an an interesting struggle. I think we all love to love other people and support them. And I've had kind of three versions of my team over the past five years. I had the people I started with minus the person who lasted a month, my team. Mm -hmm. Then I had a version 2.0 right after COVID and then version 3.0 as of last March. And with each iteration it's really actually aligned with like iterations of the practice too, where I feel like I need a change. And lo and behold, guess what? A lot of the changes, the people who are part of my team right now. So the source of stress was also me in part, but also like there was kind of a mismatch and where, where things were going. And so because of that, I think like knowing what I want, what my expectations are and being able to lead those people, I think is something that 
I'm perpetually working on refining and improving in spite of the learn like, you know, more to do with that. And especially now post COVID, all the different expectations people bring into the office when as employees um, and managing those and managing their lives and their drama. I think that's been a source of stress, but Mm. also very fortunate. I feel like all of the people I've employed have been really, really great employees. I have knock on wood, not had any of the crazy drama that you read about on social media and like hear your friends talking about and stuff too. And I think a lot of that has been like really trying to attract the people that I seek, whether that's just, you know, am I manifesting it, putting out there and also just creating the vibe here that attracts a certain type of person as well, I think is a big piece of that. But I mean, it's a struggle always and it's a struggle to manage those people and to, you know, set standards, not just expectations. I think that's a big piece that I've learned very recently that you want to set a standard as opposed to something that you want someone to do. This is what we do. So constant like growth of personal leadership and then really drawing boundaries through this process. I mean, I feel like I'm always working in Mm -hmm. some or another. I'm a very social person and within our neighborhood, like all the moms groups and stuff, inevitably conversation with somebody will turn to airway, breathing, sleep, dentistry, biological dentistry. And so I always feel like I'm on. And so Mm -hmm. I think to getting out of that new practice growth phase, I've really had to make a conscious effort to figure out like, okay, do I want to have these conversations or not? And how do I kind of step away from the conversations and focus more on other things, but still market myself and still be that person that like, To have patients draw the line between, hey, calling me Priya in the office and know your doctor again, respect your time and all that stuff. And we can have this conversation in your office as opposed to while we're out here having a good time together. Um, Mm. And, you know, some of that's good, but sometimes these patients, I've noticed like they really, they think they're my friends and some of them are my friends, but the ones who aren't that I've just met and we've had a conversation, they're calling the office like, hey, Priya wanted me to come, blah, blah, blah. You got a lot of free advice. (laughs) Yeah. We'll do our thing. But I think that's really been a real struggle because I, I mean, wherever I go, I end up giving out a card and someone calls for new patient exams and stuff. And that's great. But also like for me as a person, like you got to separate work and play, following those boundaries and really protecting them, whether it's time or people, I think has been a real struggle for me. And I feel like we've gotten we, I've come a long way, but it is something that I think, especially as someone who's like empathic and I want to help everybody, like mm-hmm. it's easy to, to get kind of cured into that. Yeah. Do you live near your practice or no? I am 18 minutes away. Oh, yeah. That's kind of, cause I was like thinking if you live further, are you the type, like if you're walking into Target like 11 at night and you're like, they're like, Hey, that's my dead. Right. And then like, Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. Kind of I mean, I've always been that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, I mean. Yeah, I can see how that would be like a lot. You know what I mean? Like I would, I would feel like, okay, I need, I need like a two month vacation or something. Like I need to get out of here kind of thing. It's funny because like, I'll go to like, I went to Tulane for undergrad. I'll go to a, like an alumni event here in town. Mm-hmm. So I'll come up to me and be like, oh, you're the dentist. And I'm like, I am. <laughs> yeah, I guess that. You look around. You're like, that a lot. I'm like, I'm not the dentist. Like there's a lot of people around here who are yeah. dentists. Like I have definitely cultivated a reputation of being a dentist and being in the community and being in the area. And that's been fantastic, really. I mean, it's helped with both, but it it also is, it's a double-edged sword and it's like, yeah, Mm -hmm. but I also would like to just do my thing. And um, most people respect that. I mean, it's not like I'm a celebrity or anything and they're like, I need a picture with you or whatever. It's just, it's like, you feel like you always have to be kind of on, you know, you don't want to around in, in your house slippers and sweatpants. Yeah. Yeah. Plus I feel like everybody has a social battery, right? And eventually it's kind of like, you're like, Hey, that's, that's one of them days where it's really low. Yeah. And yeah. they're like, Hey, right. So now I completely understand. Awesome. Priya. Thank you so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure. But before we say goodbye, can you tell our listeners where they can find you? Where can they find me? So my practice is called the whole tooth and we are in East, Southern East Dallas. Um, you can find me on the web at thewholetoothtexas.com or at the whole tooth Texas on Instagram or Facebook. And I guess that's really, really it. But those are the key ones. <laughs> no, awesome. So that's going to be in the show notes below. So if you want to reach out to Priya, make sure you go in the show notes below. And Priya, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure. And we'll hear from you soon. Thank you. This has been fun.